welcome everyone to Creative Mornings Columbus. I'm your host, David Staley, as you can see in my name right there on the Zoom link. We always uh, begin our monthly gatherings by thanking our global sponsors. And you saw the, sl uh, the slides there. That's MailChimp, Basecamp, Skillshare. Creative Mornings doesn't happen uh, without uh, the support of our global sponsors. And Creative Mornings Columbus doesn't happen without the support of our local sponsors, Beam Dental and Moody Nolan. We thank them as always for their support of Creative Mornings Columbus. Uh, I don't want to uh, put, uh, e so is it Igor or Igor Reigns, Reigns? It's Igor. Igor. So uh, are, you, uh, uh, are you zooming in from Miami? Do I have that correct? That's correct. So, uh, so I, uh, one of the things I always do is when I'm looking at the registration, I take particular note of people that are joining us from outside Columbus. And so I don't know if you have any connection specifically with Columbus, but uh, we are delighted you're joining us this morning from Miami. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I feel I feel very welcome. Um, well, you, and you are welcome, and we always welcome uh, everyone, not just simply from Columbus. We are. Uh, this is this is, I think, been one of the mo one of the most beautiful things about Zoom uh, in our yeah. last year. This is uh, obviously we would we would rather be face to face, and eventually we are going to be face to face. Uh, but if Zoom has provided us anything, it's been the opportunity to invite people from across the country, indeed across the world into Creative Mornings Columbus. So Igor, welcome. We're delighted you're here with us this morning. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. So uh, as I said, uh, uh, as you think of them, we're, uh, we're interested in uh, ideas for themes. We'll be collecting those and uh, we'll be uh, uh, contacting everyone again with, uh, with their ideas. Uh, and if you also have suggestions for illustrators, uh, uh, please, uh, please include those as well. Um, so uh, before I introduce our speaker today, I just want to remind everyone uh, that uh, we always have time for, for Q&A. As you have questions, please uh, post those in the chat box and we'll make certain to, uh, uh, that we will uh, curate these and we will include that as part of our uh, conversation uh, after, our, uh, after our speaker today. And I am very pleased to introduce our speaker this morning, who is uh, Stacy Board. Uh, as everyone in Columbus knows, she is the CEO and a featured performer of Shadowbox Live. If you've been to Shadowbox Live, you've seen Stacey Boyd. She was recently recognized as a top nonprofit CEO by Business First's C-Suite Awards in both 2019 and 2020, and as a top nonprofit innovator by City Pulse Columbus in 2019. In addition to appearing in over, is this right, Stacey, 10,000 Shadow box live performances? Yeah, don't do the math. It's really <laughs> 10,000 performances. Do the math. <laughs> Her work has been critically acclaimed by local and regional critics alike. She is, I think, that very rare person the creative who is a CEO or a CEO who is a creative. Whatever she is, we are delighted she has joined us this morning. Speaking today on the theme procrastinate, please join me in welcoming Stacy Board. Thank you, thank you. It is a honor and a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, super excited to really feel this dynamic. So you will be seeing more of me, I can guarantee. This is my first time. So first time and I'm, I'm presenting. So wish me well, wish me lots of good luck. Um, so first I wanna say that I am not qualified in any way to be giving this talk. <laughs> I am only an expert in my own experiences of procrastination. Um, and I wasn't certain that this was a good idea when David presented this to me initially. I'm like, mm. but I have to say, uh, this is one of those moments when I'm really glad that I was presented this opportunity and I followed through with it. I found this work to be so incredibly enlightening and a lot of times really mind blowing for me. So, and I hope you feel the same. So I know it's really early in the morning. Everyone's got their coffee, kind of move around in your seat, get energized. Uh, please, for the love of God, don't make me just talk to you for 20 minutes. Like, <laughs> give me some feedback here, people. I'm a performer. I like live interaction. That's why I don't do TV. Okay, so um, when I start the end of the process, I thought, okay, I need to just start as if I know nothing. 
let's start at the very beginning, right? So I thought, okay, let's look up the word procrastination. So I looked it up and it said the action of delaying or postponing something. Okay. There's no real surprises for that, uh, to that for me. And then I thought, well, wonder what a synonym is. And this is when it got interesting. So go ahead and put in the, the chat, throw out some synonyms for me for procrastinate. Delay, wait, put off. Yes. Hesitate, avoid, dawdle. Ooh, dawdle. Of course, David comes up with dawdle. Of course he does. Yes. Simmer. Yes. Great. Okay. So that's exactly right. So when I'm looking through this, the, the words that came up, lag, loiter, dawdle, dally, meaning to move or act slowly so as not to fall behind. Then the word delay usually implies putting off of something such as be a beginning or departure. We cannot delay any longer. Then procrastinate implies, here's what was like, whoa, blame worthy delay, especially through laziness or apathy. And I'm like, hold up, holy shit, what just happened, right? And I was like, I had this epiphany. I'm like, oh my God, this concept of procrastination is not just the act of putting something off, but it is, it's so wrapped up in all the shame and judgment. So then I was like, okay, I, I'm really intrigued now. So I started doing some research and I saw a really amazing article um, from Business Insider. And it was discussing the four procrastination personality types. So we're gonna do that right now. So the first one is the performer who says, I work well under pressure. Mm -hmm. So this procrastinator forces themselves to focus by shrinking the time they have to tackle a task. And they talk about how for many, um, this is very typical of those who suffer from perfectionism. So if you're tight on time, there's no way the task can be done to your unreasonably high standards, right? Um, for others, it's the issue of simply falling back on, into old patterns and beliefs that we have about, you know, our 11th hour saves. But no matter what, putting things off like that and putting pressure on yourself is, you know, it's not sustainable. So the biggest challenge to this personality type is getting started, right? Yes, Lala, exactly. She's like, it's me, it's me, that's me. Show of hands, anyone identifying with this particular personality type? Yes. And I don't suffer from perfectionism. I totally embrace the 80-20 rule. You know, I have kids, so I was gonna have a breakdown if I tried to keep 100%. So 80-20, totally in my wheelhouse. Still, this is my issue. And what I think is so interesting is that the, the solution is just setting a start date right? When you focus on beginning a task versus not when you hope to end it, you just take a lot of pressure off of yourself. And I know that I have done this with like my workouts. Like I'll say, okay, I need to just get my ass to the track. I only have to do one lap, only have to do one lap. And if after one lap, I don't want to do it anymore, I can go home. And inevitably, once I get there and I do a lap, I'm like, well, I'm already here. Might as well go do a couple others. So that I absolutely identify it with that. All right. So then the second one is the self-deprecator who says, oh, I'm so lazy right now, right? This procrastinator is actually the opposite of lazy. So when they don't do something, they're extra hard on themselves. And they tend to blame the inaction on laziness or stubbornness rather than admitting that they're tired and what they really need is just to be more compassionate with themselves. So does anyone identify with this one? <laughs> Lala's like, yep, me too. We got multiple personalities going on here. It's okay. It's okay, Brandy. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> all of, yes, all of 2020 for Jim. Exactly. So the biggest challenge for this one is taking a break, right? And of course, which I think is really funny because telling somebody to take a break who always just, you know, like it's that that's their biggest challenge is to do that. So, but taking a walk, meditating, giving yourself space so you can rebuild your energy. All right. Number, number three, the overbooker who says, I am so busy. 
So this procrastinator is a pro at filling up their calendar and is often overwhelmed because they're so busy. And that's probably the excuse we hear most often. And interestingly, some of the busiest people we work with are the ones that get the most done, right? I feel judged. <laughs> Exactly. So when busyness comes up as an excuse for not doing something, it's usually an indication of avoidance. So rather than facing the challenge head on or admitting they don't want to do something, it's easier to just bl place the blame on having other important things to do. So this, the biggest challenge for this personality type is creating chaos to avoid facing what you know that you need to face right now. So yeah, we've got a couple here that are that are feeling this one too. Counterintuitive to take a break when you're procrastinating. Yes, exactly. Because you're like, I, this. I just need to keep keep busy, keep busy. Oh, yeah, that's a whole 2020 in like in you know, re revelation. Okay, so this solution: take a moment of introspective uh, introspection and ask yourself, what am I really avoiding? So that's for number three. Then the last one, number four, the novelty seeker who says, I just had the best idea. And this is the person who suffers from the shiny object syndrome. <laughs> They're just constantly coming up with new projects to take on. And then they usually get bored with them in about a week. And so they just really never are quick to, they're quick to implement, but they just don't follow through. So they tend to be great people that are great at making decisions and taking action, but they inadvertently will lose a lot of time and burnout because they don't take consistent action in one direction long enough to see the results. Um, and interesting, they went and talked about that this is really common amongst entrepreneurs, which makes sense when you think about it like that. So this personality type's biggest challenge is called is completion. So we've got some people. Yes, I know. Why am I every one of these? I know. <laughs> We're so complex as human beings, aren't we? We are so complex. Great. So um, the, the solution for this one that they talk about is just make it stick. And they literally mean literally make it stick. Write down your new ideas or projects on a sticky new, note, but don't pursue them until you finish what you are currently working on. So I'm like, okay. So I found that to be like really enlightening. I'm like, wow, there's just like a lot of stuff to unpack with this whole notion of procrastination. So, and although I found all of that really super enlightening, what I found even more enlightening was who authored this article. And the two women who authored this are mindfulness-based coaching company. That's what they own and start. So then I'm like, oh, wow, okay. So if procrastination isn't about laziness, then if it has nothing to do with self-control, which kind of, that's what I've always kind of assumed, then what is this? So I did more research and here's the ugly about this. It's self-harm. So think about that. So what I know, oh, mind blown. So when we procrastinate, we're not only aware that we're avoiding the task in question, but also that avoiding it is probably a really bad idea. But what do we do? We do it anyway. So procrastination is not a time management problem. It's an emotion regulation problem. It's about being more focused on the immediate urgency of managing negative moods than getting on with the task, which led me to believe like, so this is kind of that internal bully, right? That voice inside um, your head sometimes that says really mean things that nobody, that, that voice would never, you would never say that to anyone, but you, you say it to yourself. So in these ruminative self-blaming thoughts and the wake of procrastination, these are known as procrastinary cognitions. So, and these thoughts, exasperate exacerbate our distress and our stress which contributes further to the procrastination so then we're like you know the hamster on the wheel right it's just like this vicious vicious cycle so when i started to think about that one of and i was like i need to do a little bit more research and i'm not kidding one of the things that popped up when i'm looking up procrastination is is procrastination mental illness was, I was like, literally like, it took my breath away. So I thought, wait a minute. Okay. Stop, 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 stop. Hold up. Time out, time out. Let's talk about this. So aren't there two sides to every story, right? Like, so, I mean, you know, 
You drink red wine, you drink a whole bottle in one night, probably not a great idea, but a glass of red wine at dinner has been known to give some health benefits. So, you know, maybe there's some positive effects or positive sides to procrastination, or am I just trying to reconcile and validate my own issues with procrastination? So this led me into this super deep dive on this concept. And what I found interesting is, you know, as artists and as creatives, you know, we're willing to explore both sides, the good and the bad. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of art is built on finding the beauty in the brokenness and the best evil characters are likable, right? Because the actor or writer who's really willing to go to that dark spot, but also humanize them, creates something incredibly compelling. So you may not agree with that character's choices, but then all of a sudden you understand why they're motivated to do what they do. So I ask myself, you know, can procrastination have a good and a bad side? And then, which led me down this path of the duality of this idea. So I came up with this idea that there's different kinds of procrastination. So you've got the procrastination that has to do with deadlines, and then the kind that has to do with no deadlines. And I find them to be very, very different. So when you have a deadline, typically we'll get it done, you know, especially if there's like public humiliation involved, if you don't get it done, like, you know, giving a presentation <laughs> versus, you know, or, uh, you know, meeting some sort of deadline where everyone's gonna know that you did or you did not do your job. So there's that, right? But what about the kind of procrastination where there is no deadline? This was really interesting. So, so think about like what, what, what could there be where there's no deadline where everybody is, you're struggling to get started? Any ideas? All right, I'm gonna throw some out here. We all know it, as soon as I say this, you're gonna go, oh yeah. Hey, how about losing weight? Oh, yeah. How about improving a relationship or getting in better physical condition overall, improving your diet, right? All these things that are just tend to be more open ended are really super difficult. And so even like with the deadlines, what I found is so interesting. It's that that we play tricks on ourselves, right? How many people have a snooze button? <laughs> Like you've got this deadline, right? You want to be awake by this time, right? But in your mind, you already know you really only have to be up by 7.15. So you keep hitting the snooze button, but like you're kind of trying to trick yourself, right? And the same is true for setting your clocks five minutes fast. I mean, aren't you the person that knows that you set your clock five minutes fast? Don't you know that you really kind of padded it? And yet I think so many of us do something like this to meet a, a, a deadline per se. Um, so that was really, I, I just really like, oh my gosh, this is really fascinating. Okay. So then I started thinking, well, are there other kinds of procrastination? Which led me to um, active and passive. So active procrastination for me, this is when you're specifically not moving forward because you're making a choice with intention and you're still trying to figure it out, you know? So I don't move until I know. I don't move until I know. And that doesn't mean I know what the end result is gonna be. I mean, I don't move until I know what step I feel comfortable taking in that moment with the information that I have at that time, right? And so when I'm procrastinating, a lot of times it's not bad. It's that I'm waiting for the clarity. You know, I'm waiting for my subconscious to figure this out because I don't know what my intention is. And I'll be honest, like, I don't think enough people do it. Like, I think people do need to slow down and procrastinate in this way and make sure that they're really clear that they understand what it is that they're trying to, to achieve. I mean, a lot of people, I think, bulldoze their way through life and just they're trying to check things off their list, right? And they're just, they're not open to the detour if they would just slow down and think of it a little bit and let the world inform their choices. I think that they would have a better result. 
And I certainly know that when I am very clear with my intention, it's energizing. It's super like, then I'm inspired and I'm ready to go. And I'm like, really understand what, what I'm hoping um, to achieve. And when you're just trying to bulldoze your way through it, it's, you know, it's exhausting. Um, as well as, it, you know, it's kind of like, you know, to paddling upstream or downstream, which one do you want to do, <laughs> right? So that was really interesting to me. So why don't people take that time? And that's when I start thinking, you know, as artists, like most people that aren't ours, they don't, they're not used to the repeated sitting with and in the unknown. But as creatives and artists, like we wear it like a blanket. I mean, the vulnerability of creating something that's never been done before requires you to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that is something that I have talked about so much with my company and my staff this year. Get comfortable being uncomfortable because that's just the only way we're going get, to get through this, right? And I even do this, I, I started thinking about how does this apply to me? You know, clearly artistic creating something new. I mean, that's pretty standard, but like even with like the business side, when I'm creating an event, like a fundraising event, in fact, I was just going through this. People are waiting on me for the title, the theme, the goal and all that. And I hadn't moved for a while because I was like, what is my intention for this event? It's not just about raising money. Of course I want to raise money. And it's not just about raising money to make improvements for the stage. Like, what is it that I really want? And what I want is I want to elevate the artistic experience for my patrons. And with those dollars raised, I want to provide technology that stretches my artists so that they're able to explore aspects of themselves that they haven't had the opportunity to do yet, right? And that's way more compelling to, to center an, a, an event around versus we just need a lot of money to rebuild our stage. So I've got to say that I feel like the artistic the, the, the discipline of the artistic practice really helps me when I'm trying to figure out business moves. And I, I, I think that they can really intertwine and we're at an advantage when we do that. And, and the same is true even like for, for theater. Like when you are playing a character on stage, you know, it's all about the clarity of the intention. That's what theater is all about. What does my character want? Why is my character motivated to say the things that they're saying? And when the director asks, stops the scene and asks, you know, how are you feeling? You're, what you cannot do is give them a paragraph about what you're feeling in that moment. You get one word, I feel angry. I feel sad I, because you can, anytime you start adding sentences or whatever, it starts getting really murky. The clarity goes away. So I found that was really interesting that when we're forced to boil it down to its smallest point, we can get through the noise. So then I started thinking, okay, so that's kind of the good side of procrastination. What is the bad side? Passive procrastination. You're not moving because you're avoiding something, clearly. And I know that I do this. And I do this when something gets to, when something needs to get done, and I don't want to do it. And right before I hit the panic button, I realize this is something I need to delegate. I need to delegate this. And it's not about just dumping on somebody. It re it's me realizing that whatever I'm supposed to be accomplishing, I, I, it, I'm not, it's, it's not resonating with me. You know, it's just, I'm not inspired to do this and I need some help. And so this just happened to me with grants. Like how many of you guys have written a grant? Yeah, like that's its own thing. Yeah, mm, it, it is like, oh my goodness. It is so much. And so there uh, was a grant that was due. I love the narrative. I love the ideas. I love doing all that part. But when it comes to like gathering data and putting it in an Excel and like gathering demographics and, and like, I hate that stuff like hate it and I'm not good at it and I don't want to do it and so as I was sitting there hitting the panic button going the deadline's coming up deadline's coming up I was like okay I need to ask for help and I did and the person that I asked to help me with this is so much better suited and did such a better job at that than I ever could have and I think when we 
analyze it and you know really kind of understand what our motivation is in our procrastination we're able to take an opportunity that's a burden to you and give it to somebody else and they look at it as a gift and and an opportunity to advance or to take on more responsibility and that's exactly what happened with me so i found that that was super interesting so i think you know as we kind of just go through life i think as, what i've discovered in all of this is we just need to be more mindful of our choices, right? Don't be a victim of the choice, but rather take control of the choice. And if we're avoiding a task, we need to own it. And we should try to figure out why we're not doing it before we hit the panic button. Like, don't let it go that far, right? And by no means have I mastered this by any means, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna work on it. The other thing I feel like we need to do Oh, I helped me see that maybe it's easy to procrastinate alone. Yes. Well, I think actually, Jesse, the having a group, they hold you accountable, right? And you have to move along. So again, it's kind of like the public humiliation kind of thing. Got some people that know that you're not doing it. I totally agree with that. So we seeking the clarity of our intention is the other thing that we can do. When you get the clarity, when you understand the intention behind the attention, it's energizing. And you know, I, I, again, you know, it's that paddling upstream versus downstream idea, right? So think through that. And then the last thing that I would leave you with is really focusing on the start of the project, not the end result. Treat it like an experiment. Take the pressure off, just start and see where it takes you. But if you treat life like an experiment and not presume to have all the answers, like I, it's just, it's a uh, much easier to get started because you're curious about the discovery you're going to find along the way. And so to that end, I leave you with this as you continue to wrestle with your own issues of procrastination. Just remember that happiness is not the finish line. It's launching off the starting block and we can't wait for our lives to change to start. We have to start to change our lives. Thank you. Stacy. thank you so much. Yeah. So I don't know where to begin. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I've, I've written down so much and uh, we have uh, other questions. Let me, well, let me start with this. And um, this is something I, I put some stars around and a couple of other people in the chat uh, made uh, made an observation. Uh, tell us a little more or, or, or uh, give us, a little more detail about what you mean uh, that art is finding beauty in the brokenness, which I thought was a really, really profound observation. Well, you know, I, I think that there's like, there's so much beauty in, in, in life, right? And, you know, to really be happy, you really kind of have to understand suffering and you need to have gone through that to understand what happiness really is, right? And I think so much uh, that so many people in the world kind of walk through life um, blindly. And, you know, this year is a perfect example. There are so many blessings in this pandemic. This pandemic has been incredibly tough. It just, you know, with, with people losing their lives, with, you know, businesses, the economic, like the emotional, it's just, it's been really, really hard. And yet, I can look at so many things and see the beauty in it. Um, and, you know, the art, the, even recycled materials, right? Like that's the art. You find the beauty in this, that's something that's old and broken down, but you repurpose it and you see it for what it is and you don't discard it. You see like the age and you understand the story behind that. And all of a sudden it, it just becomes something completely different than it was originally intended in its use. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, you know, characters like, you know, Severus Snape, you know, like, like he's, he's, he was broken, right. You know, and he was, and he, he seemed so mean. And yet when you d dived in and really understood him as a person and understood why he was motivated to do things he did, it, it, your perception changes. Um, 
So yeah, I, I don't know if that clearly answers it, but I, I you know, I, I personally am re always really interested in when it comes to art in, in diving in those dark places, because I think you just, you learn so much. It, it, uh, it does answer my question, or at least it, it gives uh, uh, the start of an answer to a really complex, really complex question. Yeah. As, uh, as, as you have questions, please uh, write these in the chat. Uh, Brandy asks a really good question. What do you do to find clarity of intention other than waiting it out? Are there strategies you use to know your intentions better? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm actively doing that. Like I, I, when I go on a lot of walks and, um, the, I, I wrestle, <laughs> like I get in the pen and I wrestle with this stuff. Like, like for real, I am not, I am willing to just get in a lot. I'll be in a meeting and I'll say, I don't know. And I'm not ready to move yet. I don't have the answer to this. Or I'll, I'll flat out say, I hear what you're saying. I understand your argument. Something's not resonating with me and I can't say yes or no yet. And we'll come back to this tomorrow. I need to kind of figure this out. And I do, I don't, you know, I don't just sit there necessarily by myself in a room and ruminate. I'm, but in the back of my mind, I'm going, okay, I need to figure this out. I need to feel like, why, why am I not clear on this intention? What is, what am I really struggling with? And I do come up with it or I don't come up with it. And I call somebody it has nothing to do with what I am wrestling with. And I'm like, you got five minutes. Okay. Let me explain the situation. Let me tell you what somebody else is telling me. And let me tell you what I think I'm struggling with. And sometimes they don't even, they don't even say anything, just me having to talk it out or whatever. And I'm like, Oh, now I know what my problem is. It's because it feels like we're supposed to be focused over here. It has nothing to do with it. Really, the issue is way over here. And we just need, we need to turn our focus over here. That will fix this. Um, so, you know, asking for help, talking it out. Yeah, I mean, but it's, it's very active. And I, you know, I get, I get scrappy with it. You know, I don't, I don't find myself, um, I don't think of myself as polished when I'm trying to find my intention sometimes. I get pretty scrappy trying to figure it out. Uh, you've, you've spent a lot of time this morning talking about sort of the creative side of mm -hmm. your, uh, of your life. Uh, when you're in the CEO role, hmm. um, so what's your relationship? So do you allow your team to procrastinate? Can you, can you do, uh, can you do that as CEO? And if so, how do you, uh, how do you, how do you sort of manage that? Talk about the, the management side of this. Well, you know, sometimes I, you just have to kick somebody's ass and go sit down, do this right now. We cannot move forward until you figure it out. So sometimes there is that, but I would say, you know, we're a pretty collaborative company um, and there's advantages to working with the same people for decades, right? You know them. And when, if someone, you know, if someone like Katie, who's my COO, isn't moving on something, there's a problem because that girl is on it, right? But she's also proactive enough to do exactly what I just said, which is call me up and go, okay, I know you're waiting, you know, I know we need to move on this, but here's what I'm struggling with. And it's just that conversation, you know, cause a lot of it is what I say to my team is like, listen, we just have to do this together. You have to let me know what you're up against. Let me know what you're up against because then sometimes I can be the person that I am for myself that, you know, that like they're in the throes of it. They're, they're wrestling with this and they're rolling up their sleeves and I'm coming in from the outside and be able to provide some perspective and just kind of like being a sounding board. So I think, you know, again, you know, strangely enough, it's that whole communication thing, right? Like just communicate. What are you wrestling with? What's the issue? And let's see if we can't figure it out together. So uh, Hillary asks, uh, how did you find your passion for theater? And was there an element of procrastination between, uh, sorry, it just got moved on me here. Was there an That's element okay. of procrastination? You can probably read it yourself too. Okay, hold on, let me look uh, it was there an element oh. of procrastination between realizing you loved it and getting involved in it? <laughs> That's great. Okay, no. so, um, Okay, so I'll just try to. 
when I was five, I'm going to tell you the story. When I was five, my mom entered me in the Little Miss Ohio pageant. Okay. I love and, this. Yeah. I love and, this story already. Okay. Yeah. And um, I was... And I did it and I gave myself a haircut the night before my bangs were all messed up. My tights were all like saggy. Like I was not even competitive, right? Like by any means. And my mom, um, I remember standing in the kitchen the next year, I was six and she was on a call and I could tell she was talking about me. I didn't know who she was talking about, but I could tell she was talking about me. And she said, um, she hangs up the phone. I'm like, mommy, what was that? And she said, oh, they were asking if you want to do the Little Miss Ohio pageant again. And I said, yeah, 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 I want to do it. And she said, oh, well, you can't, honey. And I'm like, well, why? And she said, well, there's a talent portion and you don't have any talent. <laughs> now, she didn't mean it. It sounds really awful <laughs> and she didn't mean it that way, but she was a singer and she sang around the house all the time. I did not do that. I was quietly in my room singing, like doing the hairbrush in front of the mirror, doing like, I was that kid, but I was super private about it. Like I, I didn't want to perform for anybody. So she didn't know. Right. And as a, as a little six-year-old, I literally looked at her and thought she doesn't know, like it didn't, it didn't make me go, Oh, I don't have you. I was just like, Oh, poor thing. My mom doesn't really understand all the talent that I have in this little body. She'll know sometime when I'm ready to show her. I don't know. So, so then fast forward, I'm 12 years old. Uh, my friend wants to go to community theater and uh, audition for this children's show. I go with her strictly for moral support. I have no intention of auditioning at all. I sit down and they're doing their, they're doing their audition. And I'm like, I can do that. I can totally do that. I can do that. You know? And I'm saying, and the, I mean, thankfully, this, these women are watching my body language change, you know, because they're all singing the same song, right? So now I got the song down. I've heard it 20 times and I haven't really heard it good yet and I could do it. And so they say, you know, do you want to, do you want to try? And I'm like, yeah, you know, actually I think I do. So I go up there and it's an old middle high Valley players, old theater, unbelievable, you know, resonance and sound. And I sing, I scare the shit out of myself because my voice is so big and I've never sang out before. I've always been singing like this. And I sing out and I get done and I swear to God, it's like out of a movie. And the director comes down the aisle from the dark. It's like chorus line, you know, you can't see the director. And the director comes down the line and she puts her hands on the stage and she says, honey, you need to be on Broadway. <laughs> and I got the lead of the show. And so I didn't even tell my mom, I told my mom, oh, I'm the, and I don't tell her what I'm doing or anything like that. She comes to the show. I start from the back. I've got a top hat and hails. I'm dancing down the, the whatever my mom said. She sat there in the dark going, huh, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it really just kind of came upon me. And like, luckily the universe was looking out for me and kind of threw me in the, in, but then after I did that, I really, I did. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It's a big part of who I am as a person. So I, I, it, yeah, I guess I procrastinated, you know, but then afterwards, I, once I got on, once I got started, I didn't ah, see how I'm bringing that back full circle. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> I love that story. Um, <laughs> Mid Ohio Valley players. Uh, yes. Where is that? Is that, that's not Marietta. Marietta is Ohio. That, that is Marietta. Marietta Ohio. Yeah. yeah. I you think know, we the have talked about Marietta before. I think you and I have, yeah, we, yeah. we have a connection in Marietta. It's the uh, first settlement of the Northwest Territory. Mrs. Watts would be very, very proud of me. So yeah, just so you guys know. Yes. And there's a pretty good college there. They'd be, they'd be happy yes. that I said that too. So I, I, I was on faculty of that college at one stage. Oh, really? Marietta uh, Pop. Yeah, that's I was, where yeah. I lived. Totally. So uh, Autumn earlier had written something to the effect of, uh, I have to learn how to procrastinate which I just think is a wonderful turn to phrase. Uh, can you imagine something like that, Stacy? I mean, sort of teaching, say teaching young people, all right, you're gonna have your procrastination lesson today. Actually, I do. I, I, and I, I, I think it's a beautiful way to frame that, but I, you know, in this, oh, this is a soapbox of mine. So I'm gonna keep this short, I promise. You um, got the soapbox today. So. Yeah, it, you know, I, it's, first of all, you know, it's this generation, with the technology is just amazing. And there's so many wonderful, wonderful things about that. But their lack of patience when it comes to result, like they're so used to having everything like this, that the idea of sitting and wrestling with something 
and really working it out, they feel like a failure before they even get started. And it really kind of concerns me. I really think that we, we need to do a better job of teaching our youth to stop, slow down, procrastinate, think about it and go. But, you know, they, they, they don't have to go to a library to do research. They don't have to wait for a letter to come in the mail. They don't have to go run home and see if somebody left them a voicemail message on their answering machine. All of that, like they do everything right here. Here's their library. Here's their like everything. And I, I you know, being able to teach our, our, our youth, our opinion, that it's an important part, that mindfulness of struggling and, and all of that. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. You're not a failure because you haven't figured it out right within two seconds of being presented this situation. So yeah, I think it's important. Um, how we teach them, you know, to be honest, you know, it's the arts, you know, you can't decide you want to be a guitar player and in, and in 24 hours, learn how to play. It doesn't work like that. You know, you know, you can be a singer to some degree. Some people are just naturally talented and, and that's great. But even acting wise, it's a process. It's a journey and you have to go through it. And you, and you got to, you know, you got to walk in the snow. <laughs> you got to walk in the snow for a couple miles before you really understand the work that is put into it is so worth it for the end result. Um, but, you know, my, what concerns me is that there's a lot of people that don't, they just don't even get started. In fact, I had, I had this one uh, with my younger students that I work with, and I work with Lala's um, uh, daughter, Aji, and um, who was just an amazing talent, by the way, like just, and I love, just absolutely loved her. She, she was one of the, she's at the top of the list of memories of someone who's just really, truly talented. True but, story. Uh, what now? What'd you say? I said, true story. Yeah, true story. That's right. Um, <clears throat> but there are there are people that are uh, students that are really good in one discipline, right? And we'll give them an opportunity to learn another one, and they get so frustrated so quickly that it's just not coming to them. And I'm like, you know, I gotta admit, I'm really kind of angry that you are acting as if to sing well should be easy. I'm like, I've spent my entire life perfecting this artwork. So don't come at me with your frustration that you can't do what I do after spending 30 years professionally still working to be better and better and better. Like just slow down and know your only goal is to be better today than you were yesterday. That's it. Your goal is not to be the lead. Your goal is not to get the lead song. Your goal is not that. It's, it's not that. Your goal is to be better today than you were. That's the only thing that matters. And if as a result, you get the lead, you get the lead song, whatever, great. But don't put the cart before the horse. That's not how it works. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to let Lauren uh, have the last question here. She says, um, procrastination is often about moving forward with something. How does it feel different when the procrastination leads to a decision to not do something, to make a decision to say no? That you just succeeded, right? You know what not to do. I mean, that's uh, uh, some of the things that I'm wrestling with the most is figuring out what not to do, what opportunities not to take. In fact, that's probably when I use procrastination the most is when I'm like, this feels like a real, this appears to be a great opportunity. It appeared like it would be monetarily advantageous for us to do it. Why am I not comfortable with this? Why am I not moving forward? Why am I not using our time and our resources to get this thing done? Which on paper feels, it, 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 it's like the poster child. Yeah, Stacy, you guys should do that. But then when I'm procrastinating, realizing I'm like going, no, because it's actually not us. Like, yeah, we could do it. We could absolutely do it. We do a great job at it, but it's not representative of who we aren't going to be inspired and energized to do this project. And if we're not inspired and energized to do a project, we don't do it. Stacy Board, thank you again oh, for such a uh, this was super uh, fun, inspirational, fascinating. I mean, I have all sorts of adjectives here that I oh, could, that I can describe. Um, brava, brava, <laughs> indeed. Uh, and uh, the the uh, the Zoom equivalent, uh, the hand waves and the hand claps. Um, 
we uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, practices, I think, on Zoom is that we uh, we keep the room open uh, at least for a little bit longer for people that want to stay and uh, continue the conversation. Uh, before we do that, uh, let me just uh, say or to announce a couple of things. Uh, next month, the third Friday of the month is May 21st, and that's uh, when we will assemble again. The theme next month is resilient, and our speaker mm -hmm. will be Sangeeta Lakani, who's, uh, uh, who will join us and talk about that theme. Uh, and as I said, uh, we welcome, uh, you can email us, we welcome your uh, ideas and suggestions, both for a theme that we will put forward to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Creative Mornings headquarters, and also names for um, uh, illustrators whom we'll nominate uh, for, that, uh, for that task as well. So uh, thank you again. And uh, again, we'll, uh, we'll leave the room open for a little bit. We'll continue this, uh, this terrific conversation and uh, benefit from more uh, wisdom from Stacy. <laughs> Actually, there's um, Jody asks, have I always done the 80-20 rule? No, I have not always done that. But I do it now and I'm so much happier, <laughs> let me just say. Um, that, uh, yeah, the 80-20 is like, especially when it comes to my house, I think because my life is so crazy, I really, I need order. I need order, everything needs to be in its place. Like, you know, I'm not taking a toothbrush to the garage. I'm not, it was never that, but you know, clutter, things like that. Well, then you get married and have kids and, you leave the house and when you come back, it's not the way you left it. <laughs> and I really struggled with that, you know? And I realized that I just kind of had to get it in the ballpark. Um, and by doing that, I was like, cause I was like, this is my issue. This isn't anybody else's issue. This is my issue that I have to reconcile and get over myself to realize that it's, you know, in the bigger scheme of things, it's okay. Now I can't have just complete disaster, but, but I even kind of adopting that 80, 20 in my life, um, it, it bled into other things where I think, again, it goes back to the, just getting started. It allowed me to just get started. I wasn't trying to, um, dictate where I was necessarily going to end up Necess I mean, you know, I wanted, I wanted to know what direction I wanted to go, but I didn't want to try to figure it all out. I wanted to, um, be willing to move forward and take in the information and to let it guide me so that I wasn't working in the vacuum. So I, I don't know if that, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. Um, do I have any more online presentations coming? Uh, oh, no. well, Hillary, thank you so much. Um, no, I don't have any. This isn't what I do typically. So, <laughs> like, <laughs> and Hillary, I, uh, I absolutely apologize. You're uh, joining us from Sacramento. Oh wow! Well, I, I, I welcome Igor at the beginning uh, of the of the talk, and I didn't realize that uh, you were joining us from Sacramento. So, uh, awesome. thank you for waking up very early uh, and uh, and joining us. Uh, what uh, what what drew you to uh, to uh, Columbus, or at least to this uh, to this talk? Sure, sure. So, um, I'm super grateful that um, the pandemic has opened up all of these talks to absolutely anyone. Um, so. I've read Stacy's uh, biography on on your about the speaker page, and um, it just res really resonated with me. I think growing up, I missed all the opportunities to get into theater and to get into the arts. And so now, as an adult, I'm kind of figuring out um, what's what's in me and what's possible. And um, so, reading reading about you, Stacy, was really inspiring, and I really wanted to hear from you. So, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation this morning. Oh, well, thank you for your kind words. It's really sweet of you. Thank you so much. I have to jump off for another meeting, but this was so perfect and wonderful. I miss you so much. It's so you. great to see you, darling. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Love everybody. You. Good to see everyone. Bye, Love. And Stacey, I have to say, it's fascinating that you said getting used to um, your partner and your kids and how when you get home, nothing is the same as when you left, right? So I actually uh, moved in with my partner for the first time um, about 13 months ago. And I had no idea what that was gonna be like because I am extremely organized. Everything has a place, even now, everything, I know where all my stuff is. Um, mm -hmm. But it's so interesting that actually living with someone gives me 
space to not have a perfect space. And I kind of like it in that I just, I kept everything so organized and so tight ahead of time because I felt like I had to. And now it's like, well, if that's not perfectly organized right now, I guess my thing doesn't have to be either. So um, I didn't expect that, but I've noticed it from like the very beginning, which is like a bonus. You know what I mean? It is. And I I think it teaches you, it teaches you how to surrender, you know? Um, there. Yeah. It, and uh, that was huge with me. Uh, now I will say <laughs> that I tried it once and it was so bad that that relationship didn't work. <laughs> so I, I still have guardrails. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is not working. I cannot live with this person. Oh my God. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it, it's, it, it does when it's, you know, not too much, but enough, it, it softens your, you know, the rigidness of trying to control. I think it's a control thing. I think it's like, you know, I want this here and I want this there, whatever. And like, just kind of loosening up the reins a little bit. Um, it just, it helps you um, navigate your life more, uh, more eloquently, to be honest. Yeah. Yes, to me not being organized. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? I have one one quick question that might illuminate some of this uh, for everyone here. What is your favorite transformation story from your youth education programs at Shadowbox? The one thing that surprised that was as fabulous as your story of your first time on stage singing, where you just didn't see it coming. I mean, there's so many, Jim. I mean, that's the power of. I know. You know, I, I, there isn't one. I honestly, I can't say that there's one. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of are the educational programs that we've created at Shadowbox Live, where we teach kids how to be rock stars on and off light, uh, on and off stage. And the power of the transformation, like as I, I there, there is no fear on stage. I mean, of course there's fear, but you have to act like there is no fear on stage and you get up there and this is all about courage. It really has nothing to do with talent. Do you have the balls to get up there in front of 300 people and do what I'm asking you to do? That's the only thing that matters. And, and to see these kids you know, who are very, very timid all of a sudden learn how to project and how to be silly and not be afraid to make, make themselves look ridiculous, to go for the high note. I mean, when they do it and they're six, they, there is a new light about them. There is a new light about them and they realize, I'm like, you know, what's the worst thing? I always say, what's the worst thing that's going to happen if you don't get this high note? Like for real, what's going to happen? You crack. Okay. I didn't pay to hear you. I don't give a shit crack, but you got to go for it. Like you don't know what your boundaries are until you go until you hit the, the, you know, the absolute furthest thing that you think that you can do. And if you don't do it, guess what we're going to do? We're going to change the line. Who gives a shit? Just like, we're going to change the line and it's going to sound awesome and nobody's going to care because if they know the song, they're going to go, oh, that's a really interesting artistic interpretation of changing that line. That's really cool. Or they don't know the song anyway, and they don't care. They, you sound great and you're comfortable. So we're just going to do that. Or the idea is you actually hit it. Oh my God. Whoa. Then all of a sudden you're a rock star that hits this high note that never thought that they could. So you can't lose if you try. But if you decide before you try that you can't do it, you just lost out on all those opportunities. And there's no one to blame but for yourself because I can do this shit. It's this opportunity is for you. So if you want me to sing the song, I'll sing the song. But, you know, I do it all the time. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's just that power of, and you know, I'm always like, you know, you don't have cancer. This is all relative. It's a high note in a song. Or, you know, you, you're not getting the laugh or you're not getting analyze why are you not getting a laugh in this sketch you know why because you're not taking time that's right you're just kind of going through the lines up there you're not taking time so come on man like chill out commit let's do it so yeah stacy i'm gonna go uh yes. teach a class right now so uh but i just want to thank you again and uh, please uh, uh i don't want to interrupt the conversation i just wanted to uh give you uh, give you my thanks again well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. This has been a really, really wonderful opportunity. You guys will see me again uh, for certain. So I'll be visiting. So, and it looks like I'm going to close on a house. So 
Yay. Yes. Yay. Uh, everyone should know in the midst of this, she's uh, she's selling her house and she uh, gave this fantastic uh, talk as well. So. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was so nice meeting you and I, I appreciate you so much. So everybody take care.